Yes, welcome to a health and wellness webinar sponsored by Capital Cares, featuring Susan McCormick from the Wellness Connection. Now, why would a martial arts and fitness brand be offering a health and wellness webinar? Our community does a pretty good job of maintaining our physical health, but sometimes we need to prioritize our mental health. And sometimes, just like with martial arts training and exercise, we need a coach to help put us in the right direction. We are recording this webinar for those who cannot make it this evening. And if you have questions, please put them into the Q&A. That will keep you anonymous. Now, of course, if, um, if you feel comfortable, you can also put a question in the chat or if you can't find the Q&A, it's not mandatory that you are anonymous, but if you feel there's stigma associated with uh, health and wellness training or you just prefer to remain anonymous, we really do want to honor that. And I want to start by introducing Rajiv. Rajiv is a longtime member of Capital and attends classes at the Loudon facility. He is responsible for our website and can be found helping new members as they begin their martial arts and fitness journeys all the time. He's an integral part, an integral part of our team. And it was his idea to put together this evening's webinar. So Rajiv, I am certain that everyone here really appreciates your, thought, uh, your thoughtfulness and your effort. And Rajiv, I'll leave it to you to introduce today's presenter. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, a few, you see, uh, the agenda for the evening is, Jeremy kicked this off. Um, I'll go through some housekeeping logistics. Uh, some of it Jeremy covered, I'll intro. Susan, after that, we'll have a discussion on sort of mental health. She has prepared some slides uh, quite graciously and uh, I'll be giving the screen to her and she'll be walking through that. Um, and then, and then at the end, sort of, we'll have some Q and A. So, if you have any questions throughout the um, webinar, just so feel free to sort of post them into the window, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, and as um, you know, it's it, while everybody is muted, it's always a good idea to mute audio on your side as well. As Jeremy pointed out, that uh, it, this is being recorded, and we can email the link to the participants after the webinar. Um, and uh, you know, we'll unmute the audio at the end of the Q&A session. Uh, the primary speaker, the main speaker is Susan McCormick. She's the founder and owner of the Wellness Connection. She received both her master's degree in, in marriage and family therapy along with her bachelor's degree in business from Virginia Tech, a fellow Hokey. Um, I found, and she, in her own words, and I'll speak uh, for her here, uh, she states that she founded the Wellness Connection in 2009 um, in order to sort of create a one-stop shop that brings together uh, with your providers in a collaborative partnership to optimize sort of health and well-being. In this collaborative aspect, that really it's, it is this collaborative aspect that really sets the Wellness Connection apart from other providers that you uh, see around town. Uh, they meet regularly to discuss cases and use different modalities, and Susan perhaps can get into what they are to help the clients feel better, faster, and stay better longer. Um, and we see that it's, uh, she certainly sees through her work that it is working and encouraged by the incredible support from the community. So thank you, uh, Susan. And, and I do wanna say on a personal note, um, everybody who has taken the time to join the webinar, that a huge thank you to all of you to support this. Um, Capital hasn't done this stuff before, um, and I'll speak uh, from what I know. Um, certainly, we are learning uh, in, in, in different ways of supporting the community and uh, realize that there is a concept called 360 degree view of uh, mental and physical fitness. So uh, this is a small step in kind of giving back to the community. With that, um, Susan, I'll stop the share if you can uh, share the screen. Okay, I'm gonna not, I, now I gotta make sure I can do this properly. So I did it right to start. Yep. <clears throat> okay. And then we're gonna go here. So I think we're good. I did it. All right. Well, welcome everybody. It's so nice to be here with you guys. I was so excited, encouraged. Um, my mind was actually blown when I found out that a fitness and health center was interested in really putting mental health front and center. Like there's not a lot of people um, that would kind of take the risk, I think, to talk about this whole notion of mental health because it's a topic that um, 
can be really difficult for a lot of people. And so I really want to commend, you know, Jeremy and Raj for this being your idea, and Noel for putting it all together, and, and Don as well, because I think I hope that more companies like yours are are really putting a spotlight on this subject so that we can all start supporting each other because it's been a rough year. I think we'd all agree, but even before this year, you know, we've noticed this kind of steady increase in issues with um, anxiety, depression. A lot of trauma has come forth. I mean, you can see it with the Me Too movement and what's happening with racism and all these, these um, political issues that are going on. So um, we really have to start getting serious about how we approach this. So I'm so honored to be here to talk to you guys, to, to share my knowledge and hope that it helps you in some way. Um, so my name is Susan. Raj told you a little bit about me. Um, and I, I like to say that I'm kind of the poster child for um, how mental health can really change your life. Um, I always like to share with the story because I sometimes feel like stories can paint a picture and let you kind of understand where my motivation comes from. But um, about, I guess it's 19 years now almost, I lost uh, my husband in a car accident. Um, you know, at the time, my life was kind of plugging along and things were going really well. And then it felt like the rug just got pulled out from underneath me. And I was thankful that my sister and some friends found me a really good therapist to kind of just talk through the grief that I was experiencing. And my thought and desire was, well, let me just deal with the grief. And then once I'm done with that, I'm going to be ready to go. And I, I just want to get back to work and start being that person that I was before that. But here's kind of the funny thing. Sometimes the most difficult things that happen to us, uh, they happen to us for a reason because they're meant to teach us something. And, and oh, was I in need of some teaching. So, um, you know, I went through therapy. I decided to, to become a therapist as a result. And I really learned that the very worst thing that happened to me um, was actually the thing that was intended to teach me something and kind of transform my life. And so that's exactly what it's done. So I've been asked to kind of talk to you guys about stress and how it affects us and to kind of just, you know, from a society's perspective, talk about how we react to these things. But, you know, stress is not just something that we feel in our body or something that we think about. It affects everything from our body to our mind to our behavior, our emotions, all these things. And we, we feel it in so many different ways. Um, what I've noticed for a lot of people though, is that a lot of people don't know what it is because so many of us um, really kind of function from what I call the neck up, you know, meaning that we experience this world. Um, we, we're very thoughtful about it. We tend to ruminate, we think, but very rarely do we stop sometimes and just check in with our body to see how it's doing. Um, no one's got a lot of time for that. And so stress can, you know, impact us in a lot of ways. And certainly it's gotten a lot of worse due to the pandemic. Um, I'm a very much of a science girl. So I like to sometimes share science with people just to kind of help you understand. Because I think there's a lot of people out there that think that, um, you know, stress is something that they do very well, that it doesn't impact me. It's okay that I only sleep six hours a night. I look at, I'm successful at work, I'm doing great, so stress is, I'm fine with it, right? Well, I think it's important for people to understand what it does, not only to our bodies, which was the previous slide, but it really does impact our brain. You can see on the left side here that that's an optimal brain, you know, someone that's, you know, balanced and grounded and dealing, you know, with their emotions and, and possibly hasn't experienced trauma. And then you've got the right hand side here, which is a lot of stress where you can actually see that holes can be created, which is going to impact your brain's ability to function. So, you know, when you talk about having, you know, in the middle of the day, sometimes we can get really foggy or sometimes, you know, we've just got persistent, you know, um, uh, we can't recall things, our memory's not working well, or if we're working on a project, we just don't seem to be able to be creative sometimes in that. Oftentimes that can be the result of stress in our bodies and our inability to kind of uh, manage that. So this next one just really talks about the prevalence of depression. Like it's, this is something that's, that's on the rise and I can only imagine, I don't think these, this data has been updated since the pandemic, but you can see the median age is 32, um, 35 percent of the people that are really struggling with mental health, they don't get the help they need. So all of this stuff has, it, you know, this thing that's happened with the pandemic, you know, it's impacted not only what we do socially, it's impacted what we do on a daily basis. We can't go to our jobs, we can't go to school. In some cases, there's, you know, um, food insecurity. 
Um, I think the biggest thing though, is this whole notion of um, not having access, that socialization that's been that's been impacted. And I think many of you, if you're part of you know, capital, that you have recognized that your social network has somewhat been diminished and that can be, have a really severe impact because our socialization is one of the most important things when it comes to um, our own mental health. So I think that's why Capital wanted to do this. Like they're really hearing what you're saying. They're, they're listening to what's on the news and they're recognizing that this is a big issue. Um, so going on to the next slide here, this is just talking more about, you know, depression is, you know, I, we, we kind of look at our mood as, and I've actually learned this from Annette, she's on the call with us, but, you know, our bodies are meant to function what we call kind of neutral. And neutral is when, you know, we're able to respond appropriately to the stimuli around us. Um, you know, if a car is coming after us, we can, we can shift into fight or flight so we can get out of the way of that car. If we've been overworked or overstressed or just run a marathon, we know how to shift into rest and relaxation to allow our body to heal. And then we're supposed to be able to shift back into neutral whenever any of those events happen. Well, for many of us, we get, uh, we get stuck in some of those places. You know, if we have too much rest and relaxation, that can start to look like depression. If we have too much of that fight or flight that's happening all the time, we get stuck there. And what I can tell you is when we get stuck in either of those places, it can be certainly problematic, right? And so the goal of what therapy and, and lots of these different therapies that I'm gonna to talk to you about today is to teach people how to get back to neutral. And I dare to say that many of us on this call are probably stuck in, the, I mean, there's so many people stuck in that fight or flight kind of space, you know, where um, it's just like our bodies are constantly being triggered and constantly being, um, um, distracted, if you will. I mean, you just look at how many episodes of, you know, Schitt's Creek have you watched, you know, the binge watching that's happening. So we've created a space where our minds are constantly being stimulated and it's not actually how our body was supposed to be um, organized. So this next one is really just looking at symptoms. You know, I think most of us could probably look at this chart and say, hmm, you know, I've, I've felt those things before. I've felt sad and I've, I've had, you know, mood changes and I'm, I haven't slept really well, you know, since, since January. So um, I think many of us can look at a lot of these and say, well, isn't that normal? And a lot of them can be, but most of us would say that the sleeping problem has maybe been persisting for a couple of years. You know, I think um, certainly life is going to deal us things that's going to have these things happen to us, but um, learning to kind of recognize, you know what, this isn't going away. This sad feeling isn't going away. Um, you know, I've been angry a lot, just reacting and it's not my normal way. You know, these could be signs that you're really struggling with some symptoms relative to, um, to mental health. Um, this slide I like because I think it's really important for people to understand that our emotions are really stored in our body. You know, it's similar to if you had a, a car accident and you, and you broke your leg, you know, you would have a, a, a trauma, a physical trauma to your leg. And the expectation is once you've experienced that trauma, you're going to go to doctors, um, they're going to set it, you know, they're going to put it in a cast and let it heal. Um, and then they're going to do physical therapy with it, right, to rehab it so that you can get back to normal. Well, emotional trauma is really no different than this physical trauma. Um, so when we've experienced, um, you know, difficulties in our, in our childhood and, and, or just through life and growing up, those traumas actually are stored or those emotions are stored in our bodies at the cellular level. So a lot of us think that if we just don't think about it or we don't talk about it or we don't allow our mind to go to it, well, then it's gone. You know, you know I don't have to worry about it. Sadly, um, our bodies have a way better memory than our brain does, right? Our body doesn't let us forget. So some of you, um, you know, may have experienced, you know, migraine headaches, or you may have experienced things like neck and shoulder, or you clench your jaw. I'm one of those people. Um, you may have heart palpitations, or you might have like gut issues all the time, right? Like these can all be signs of actual uh, emotional trauma. And most people just chalk it up to, well, you know, my family was like that or different things. But, you know, the important thing to notice is that oftentimes our body is trying to give us a message that it wants to let go of some of these early experiences so that we can heal from them. Um, so this is the, the reality is, is that when we're asking people to kind of face some of these childhood experiences, you know, we're asking people to be vulnerable, you know, and I think most people here, uh, or a lot of people 
feel that vulnerability is actually a weakness. You know, they feel that, you know, being vulnerable is um, like putting your heart out there for someone to stomp on it so that you can be judged for it. Um, and that's really unfortunate because vulnerability is actually, um, um, it's, 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 it's something that allows us to kind of heal. And for many of us, you know, we see it as, you know, um, something that we don't want to do. But if we can find a place where we can kind of take the fear that's related to these emotions and we can mix it with a little bit of courage, it actually can take us to some pretty beautiful places. Um, you know, vulnerability is all about our fear of having people see us and having them judge us or, or um, not want to be near us because of, of that authentic expression of who we are. And you know, normally what we find in therapy is that when people find a voice for that vulnerability, um, there's this notion of surrender. There's this notion of them kind of recognizing that somebody is sharing with them in that experience. And when it's met with empathy and compassion, it can be incredibly healing. Um, certainly when vulnerability is met with judgment and shame, it can be not healthy. Um, but, you know, finding a safe place to share them is important. So I'm not just saying go out and start sharing with people over a beer, everything that's going on. But that's what I think therapy offers is the ability to really authentically show up who you are and to start creating, you know, what we call a new relationship with self. And, and for us, vulnerability can really bring people to places like joy and love and creativity um, and change, really. And so we really do encourage this notion of vulnerability. Um, and if any of you are like me, before I went to therapy, uh, this is kind of how I treated anybody being able to truly see who I was. Um, you know, for, for me, if something bad happened, I would often put it in a box and I would kind of wrap it in duct tape and I'd, I'd put it on the top of that shelf and I would cover it up with every sweater and anything that I could so that nobody could even find a chance of finding this, um, this reality about me. You know, and so I find that most of my clients would rather fly under the radar and not be seen than to authentically be seen for who they are, you know, and for me, that's so difficult because um, I find that so many people are stuck in these negative narratives and those narratives don't even come close to resembling who these people are. And so the work in therapy is often helping them shift that narrative so they can really step into um, uh the person that they were intended to be or the person that they really desire to be. And here's the reality, you know, we live in a place <laughs> where we like to numb. And I'm gonna go through these quick because, you know, when you take a look at, you know, how many of us deal with vulnerability or how many of us deal with shame or how many of us deal with different things, our first inclination is to kind of numb it, you know? And I've always said that we are the most in-debt, prescribed, addicted, obese, <laughs> perfecting um, distracted cohort in US history, right? So when you really take a look at how many of us, my husband and I were kind of laughing, looking at these and we're like, damn, that pizza looks good. And hey, that glass of wine I'm looking forward to. Like we could actually see that, man, so many of those things naturally bring us to them because they temporarily numb us. And then it makes us feel like we're better, you know, but we all know that that numbing has a short life and um, over time, when we continue to ignore these things that are really under the surface and bothering us, it, the, the problems can get bigger and bigger and the num numbing can get bigger and bigger. Um, so I've been challenged with kind of talking to you guys mainly about your emotional well-being. And so um, uh, I feel like, oh, so before I do that, you know, I think there's one notion that I like to bring up, which is that, you know, a lot of us I, I like to look at these narratives that we have as, um, I think Brene Brown refers to them as our shitty first drafts, right? Like they are the things that, um, uh, you know, all these things that have happened to us in life, we've started to create what we call a narrative in our brain about who we are. And like I said, most of them are wrong. So my approach to this is kind of approaching these narratives like it's a, it's a really just bad first draft, you know? And it's like any good masterpiece that is created, it goes through many, many, many renditions to kind of get to what that final product is, you know? And I feel like that's what kind of life is for us. We're going through lots of these different experiences and all we need to do is get out our, our massive little um, erasers and start erasing those parts that don't really resonate with who we want to be or even who we think we are. 
Um, and sometimes therapy is the way to kind of get you from that place of that first draft to kind of redefining it. So you actually can step into that new narrative that often can offer like infinite possibilities. So um, I promised I would talk about all the pillars associated to wellness. And so I just want to go over this quickly and I'm, I'm keeping an eye on time here so I don't go over. Um, I'm going to focus on emotional, but one of the things I just want to, I want to talk about is when you take a look at all of these pillars that are all about how we can be well, right? You know, intellectually, we have to be stimulated. Physically, we should be fit. Occupationally, we should be challenged. You can look at any of those things. You know, I find that when it comes to our emotional well-being, and you guys may or may not agree with me, but when I hear people talking, it feels often like we put that emotional well-being at the bottom of the of the priority list. You know, it's like I got to get my finances well. I got to make sure that occupationally I'm doing well and that I've, I'm working out and getting fit and, and looking good. You know, sometimes that emotional piece is the thing that we put at the bottom. And and I don't think it's any surprise that emotional is kind of at the top of this, you know, flower, if you will. And I think the reason for that is if, if we could actually take that, uh, that emotional kind of component of wellness and we were to put it kind of at the top, I think what we would notice is all these other things would start to fall in place, you know? Um, you know, oftentimes the stress that comes from all of these different elements can really impact us emotionally. And over time, if we don't tend to it, it can really start to have a negative impact on all these other pieces. So, uh, so I, some people say, why would I go to therapy? You know, who wants to go in and complain and talk about what's happened to me in the past? And, you know, what's, what's it going to help me? Why is it going to help me to sit there and talk about all these bad things that happened to me when I can't even go back and change them, right? So um, this is one of my favorite quotes that I actually learned from Annette Eccles. She's a, a cranial sacral therapist that works with me at the Wellness Connection. And we've always talked about how people are always fighting us about wanting to go back in the past and kind of look at their history. And, you know, we really believe that if you don't understand your past, it's really hard to have a, a, an outlook for your future. You know, we feel like the knowledge that you have from your history is actually going to inform what that narrative is and give you the strength to kind of go where you're going. So I promised um, Raj that I would spend some time going through what does therapy look like? Because some people aren't really keen to it. I get it. So I just thought I'd give you a flavor of it by giving you kind of a feel of, of what I do when I work with clients just to expose you a little bit to it. And please, you know, start chatting away your questions and sending them to Noelle. She's going to share it with me here at the end. But, um, you know, I like to think of um, all of us that when we are born into this life, right, we are born with this inner light. And that's why this lantern just makes sense to me. It's like, we all have it. And sometimes people come into my office and they're like, Susan, my, my light is out. I am, I have nothing to look forward to. I don't even know who I am anymore. They feel like that light has been put out. And I always say the light is always there because we never lose any parts of us, the good parts, the bad, like every part of who we are from what we've developed and designed into is still very much a part of you. Um, but what does happen when that light is burning is that sometimes life and experiences and people can, can create what I call dirt or soot on the inside of that lantern. And over time, if we're exposed over and over again to negative experiences, the lenses on that lantern can get quite dirty and it can look as if your light is out. But really all that's necessary is for us to go in there with a good old you know, thing of some Windex and clean off that lens so that so that you can start to get back to that light. And, and therapy is all about trying to find what that light is and reconnecting you to it and then letting it grow and get bigger and bigger. So what does traditional therapy look like? This is scary, I'm sure to many of you, but the way that I work and the way that I believe wholeheartedly in is that your past is important, not only because of the experiences that you had, but one of the things that most people don't understand is that emotions are in DNA. So whatever your great, great, great grandfather or grandmother experienced got passed down and passed down. And so sometimes our emotional states can be very much predetermined based on our DNA and how we come in. And then oftentimes we're exposed to those same kind of emotions. And so we've got that thing of nature and nurture, right? How we come into this world with our DNA, what we're exposed to and how that impacts us. So I do spend some time kind of looking at who are the people that are in your family? 
You know, who were your mom and dad? What did they come from? What did they experience? Was there trauma? Was there alcoholism? Was there mental health issues? Because we can't just like, you know, diabetes and, and, and um, cancer and heart disease, all those things can be passed down through genetics. Well, so can emotional states. So me understanding what you've been exposed to is gonna have everything to do with how I determine what treatment plan I wanna work with you on. Um, and this is probably the part that people fight me on, right? I, why do I need to go back? I don't wanna do, I just wanna, this is what I want, tell me how to get it. Um, and I can sometimes help do that, which is more solution focused therapy. But my belief is if we don't understand where you are vulnerable and how you are protective, I, I can certainly help you get this one kind of fixed, but you're gonna just keep coming back to me over and over again if we don't get to the root of these problems and learn how to kind of fix them. This next thing kind of, I, I work, so that, that last thing is called a genogram where I look at your family history. And this is really what I call, it's called internal family systems or parts work. Um, and this is a big cornerstone to how I work. And I think it helps people understand how therapy works. I'm hoping these pictures help, but you know, typically we are raised um, and we have experiences. So let's just say that you were born into a family that, you know, the dad was an alcoholic, or maybe um, your first boyfriend really did a number on you when he broke up with you. There can be so many things, like normal things that happen and then really quite traumatic things that can happen to you. And when those things happen to us, it makes us feel awful, you know? And so we might feel not good enough, or we might feel unloved, or we might feel fear, you know, if we're really in a lot of chaos. And when we feel those emotions, we don't want to feel them, right? Whenever we feel that kind of stuff, we want to get rid of them. And that's why we call them exiles, right? Like we just want to take those terrible feelings and we want to get rid of them so that we never experience them again. And to do that, to actually exile those emotions, we have to um, create managers. And the manager's job is really just to protect um, these exiled parts, right? So managers come in and they're like, uh-oh, um, you know, that, that not good enough parts really getting triggered right now. So I'm actually going to do everything perfect. And if I do everything perfect, maybe that part will never feel not good enough. Okay. I hope you're following me. Um, so we've got exiles. Don't like them. Those are the icky feelings. Managers are really just your coping strategy so that you never feel those emotions. And then firefighters are those numbing behaviors. So remember I showed you those slides a little bit ago. Um, I always say the firefighters are sex, drugs, and alcohol. Um, but now it's getting more complicated because that was back then. And now we have cutting and eating disorders and we have Amazon disorders, like shopping excessively, you know, it's just like nonstop shopping. Um, and now we have Netflix and we have streaming and we have, you know, we are staying up till two, three in the morning, watching eight episodes to get through things. All those are what we call numbing behaviors. You don't think it when you're doing it, but their intention is they're allowing us to escape our own lives. So, and living kind of vicariously through the lives of these characters that show up on TV. So I'm not saying you're an addict if you're watching those things, but I want you to really pay attention to how often those behaviors pull you away from that true authentic connection with others. And that's really what we're aiming for. So in this work, um, this is kind of what I do. I, I, with my clients, I usually map parts for them, right? So we look at, you know, all of us are kind of, you know, born with this inherent goodness. And the intention is like our core self is, I want you to remember a time when you, I don't know, when you fell in love. <laughs> I mean, we're all invincible when we fall in love, right? So I want you to think about when you fell in love or maybe when you got this incredible dream job that you wanted, or maybe you got into the college of your first choice, you know? There are times in life that we feel, you know what? I'm all right, you know? Um, and normally we say, this is when you feel calm and confident and compassionate and you feel connected. Like, so I always know if I'm operating in a part, if I can say no to anything in that blue circle. Um, the orange circles are those exiled parts, right? Those are the parts that we're always trying to get rid of. And those are things like I had shared with you. And so these are, this is just kind of an example um, but my work through the use of that genogram is to fill out what I call mapping the parts for each of my clients. So I always think visuals are a helpful aid. And so you can kind of look at, man, where am I really vulnerable? Where are, you know what, that unloved shows up a lot of places. And that's why I'm such a pleaser. I now understand that, you know, and when things get really bad, I'll go out on a, you know, an all night binge of drinking because um, sometimes I just feel like I'm never going to be loved. And no matter how pleasing I am to people, it seems to never be enough. 
So I'm hoping this kind of helps you understand how emotions work and how they're characterized and how we kind of, you know, approach it. And, and for me, my approach is about, you know, finding a voice for these exiled managers, right? Those are the epitome of vulnerability. So if I can provide a voice for vulnerability, often there's an opportunity to heal um, because oftentimes we go through life really operating from these green circles, right? They are, they are driving the bus per se. And so sometimes I've got to kind of sit next to those little green parts and I got to ask them to kind of move over so I can allow some of these vulnerable parts to talk about what they experienced, how they interpreted it, what are their coping strategies, how is that serving them now? Because um, here's the really sad reality. Most of us tend to act the age we were when we first experienced that vulnerability. Isn't that kind of scary? <laughs> like some of us go into a fight with our, our, our kids or with our husband or whomever, um, operating from sometimes a much younger part. And most of these parts get developed between the ages of like four and five and like 15 or 16. Isn't that kind of freaking you out? It did me. Like, most of my coping strategies were developed between the ages of five and six and like 15. Are you kidding me? Like, so my job is to kind of go back and really explore these parts so I can evolve them into a more mature version that's had a lot more experiences. So I'm not so quick to temper. I'm not so quick to perfect, or I'm not so quick to do these things that I'm learning to actually settle when things get difficult. So that's that. Um, another really common way of, uh, or therapy that we offer to people is what's called cognitive behavioral therapy or CBT therapy. You may have heard of it, but you know, what we recognize is that the way that we feel and behave is often driven by how we think. And it's a very linear process. You know, if you think about it, usually there's an event that happens and then we have thoughts about it and those thoughts create feelings and then those feelings create behaviors. And so oftentimes people will come in and say, I, you know, I punched my sister and I'm like, all right, well, why'd you do it? I don't know. We just did it, you know? And so I always say it's like a, it's a Monday morning quarterback, right? Where I come in and I have to put everything in slow motion so we can really start looking at how people think, because in my opinion, um, our thoughts are really the thing that gets in the way of our ability to be all of who we're intended to be. And so cognitive behavioral therapy is about recognizing those negative thoughts and learning how to shift them. And, and even though it sounds so easy in principle, it's hard in execution. And so it requires a little work with a therapist to kind of teach you how to do that and how to ground yourself. Um, but you know, you can't, you can't change a behavior without changing a thought. You can't change a feeling without changing the thought. So I always say, go to where you're gonna have the most bang for your buck and, and start with the thoughts. And so that's a big part of therapy too. So this is where I wanna talk about, so a lot of people like, and sometimes it makes me a little crazy and it's really sad because I am a talk therapist, but you know, people say talk therapy, talk therapy, but I want people to know that talk therapy is not just the only um, answer in supporting mental health issues. Um, we, you know, at the Wellness Connection, we've got lots of different kinds of therapies and our intention is to really help people find the modality that works for him works for them, right? Because not everybody learns the same way. Not everybody expresses the same. Not everybody loves face-to-face -face talking. Like there's a lot of people that don't do well with that. It's intimidating. And so I really want to offer like different modalities for people to try and explore what they're doing because so much of mental health is about focusing on the emotions. And then what I like to do is that you really have to get the synergy between your mind and your body working. So if I heal trauma, just from an emotional perspective, but the body is still holding on to it. Because remember, the body holds on to everything. If the body isn't collaborating with the brain for healing, then oftentimes it can come back. So I'm a big believer in complementing the work that I'm doing emotionally with other kinds of therapy. You know, cranial uh, sacral therapy is all about regulating the central nervous system. Um, it's, it's, um, it's done with touch. It's done on a table. You know, a lot of people fall into a deep state of relaxation and experience wonderful um, outcomes as a result of it. And I, Annette's actually on our call with us tonight. Um, but the moment I started working with Annette, she has the ability to really explore. And, you know, a lot of people get really uncomfortable when you start talking about energy, right? I know I did until I started actively participating in some of these other things and seeing how they help my clients. But energy has always been kind of woo woo. Well, I mean, start reading some of the medical journals because they're really coming out with this thing called energy is a very big proponent for healing. 
So cranial sac sacral really works with energy and can help with ancest ancestral kind of emotions that you're holding on to holding on to. Um, and it can also help you identify where in life things have happened to you to let the body let go of it. You know, hypnotherapy helps people get to that really deep state of emotion because if we're really anxious, it's really hard to accept influence from people um, to change. So hypnotherapy, we don't get you barking like a dog or, or doing anything like that. It, hypnotherapy is about uh, teaching you how to get your body into this really deep state so that you know, you're willing to kind of try some of these new things. You know, acupuncture is the same way. You know, when trauma exists in the body, our body can stop communicating well with knowing, oh, when am I hungry and when am I sleepy? And when, you know, all these hormones kind of in, inform how our body responds and acupuncture can really help get the body back into sync so that it starts acting the way it's supposed to. That's the best way I can. And it, it cures things like, you know, migraines and sleep and irritable bowel syndrome. And for women who can't get pregnant, man, send them to an acupuncturist. That is kind of miracle work in motion. Um, we have art and music. You know, we don't have music right now, but we partner with other people. We have an art therapist on staff. But, you know, if you love music and you write music and you love that, then I would use that as your modality of expression. Or if you love to, to draw an art, like those are really useful ways of, of healing. You know, uh, if you love animals, equine and dog therapy, we do have a couple of dogs uh, on site that I'll show you some cute pictures late, later. Um, and there's a whole lot of new research coming out on psychedelics for trauma. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that, but you know, EMDR, yoga, meditation, sound baths, like these are all things that you may not have heard about that I would suggest find what your gut is telling you is a good thing to do and follow it, you know, and I'm happy to introduce you to some of these things and, and let you explore them. I'm a big believer on meditation. A lot of people poo poo it. Even I, when I first got started in this world of, of um, mental health, I was kind of a poo pooer because I, I actually realized that I used to do um, the jujitsu kind of exercise with you guys. So I've always been a hard kind of boot camp workout sweat, feel like you're dying so that you feel better afterwards. Um, and so I didn't really have time for yoga or meditation. And then I realized that meditation is really an exercise for the brain in the opposite direction. So instead of trying to rev it up and, and, and flex it and do all that stuff, what we're trying to do, do is cool it down. So if you look at this picture, the, the picture on the left is a brain that is, um, you know, dealing with the normal stress of life. And you can see the red and the yellows and, you know, that kind of, it looks like it's on fire a little bit, right? Well, when your brain is on fire, it doesn't function well. Um, your memory is in, impacted. Um, your motivation is impacted. Um, your creativity is impacted. Like it really can slow you down and not allow your brain to kind of function the way that it's supposed to. And then if you look at the brain on the left, that's just 10 minutes. Like if you can't find 10 minutes to just find a quiet place to do meditation, well, then we need to talk, right? Then, but this, this coolness on the right side is when you're going to be able to utilize a more, a more present brain, a more active brain, a more creative, it's going to solve problems that you couldn't solve before it. You know, I used to say that my best problem solving was done on the acupuncture table or after when I was in Shavasana and yoga, like that's when I, I was like, why didn't I think of that? You know, it's because when my brain is on the left side, it just, it just doesn't work well. I want to quickly just talk about psilocybin um, and I want to try and wrap up quickly because I want to make sure we've got plenty of time for Q&A, but there's a whole growing um, level of research coming out on um, the use of psychedelics for treating trauma. You know, trauma is a really big issue that we are all dealing with, you know, just with what's been happening um, uh, with the, the war in Iraq and, and, and many men that are in combat and coming back. Um, but you even look at trauma, sexual trauma, or um, people being neglected or excluded. You know, there's a lot of ways in which people experience trauma. And oftentimes the analogy I give, I've got my cap here. I don't know why I use this, but you know, when you think of trauma, so here's, here's the brain and here's trauma and it gets in the brain. And when it happens, the brain has a tendency to kind of make this kind of sensation with it. And they put that trauma as deep into the brain as possible so that we never have to experience it again, right? And for talk therapy, sometimes it's really hard to get to it because this, this holding on is this protective way. And I always say in talk therapy, I might get one finger open and maybe a thumb open and I can kind of see it. But as soon as it gets triggered, it, it shuts back up again. 
What I like about psilocybin and the use of ketamine and all these different therapies that are coming out is that it takes the brain. If you look at the left side, that's a normal brain. If you look at the one on the right, that's a brain on psilocybin. Look at all the connections, right? So the connections on the psilocybin side to the connections on the left, when there's trauma, most of those connections that are happening in the brain can get disrupted. When you're on psilocybin, it almost can regenerate these connections in the brain, right? So that you can actually, <laughs> I always say back to my trauma, when you're on psilocybin, it kind of allows the brain to go like this and open up. So for that period of time, I can actually take a look at that trauma but more importantly, it shifts the brain from a place of shame and judgment, which nothing's going to heal. Like you, you add shame and judgment to anything, it's going to die. You know, when you open it and you can actually look at it with the help of a therapist, right? In a very medically, this is, I'm not saying go out and do magic mushrooms. I'm not saying go out and do mollies or LSD. It's really actually can be quite harmful if it's not done with the right dose, with, a, with the um, right environment and without a trained professional to help you through you know, the trip as they say. But the most important part is that the brain goes to a place of compassion that you can see that trauma. And it actually allows, when it's open like that, it allows the trauma to leave so that you're no longer holding on to it. So um, it was making tremendous strides before COVID. It got put a little on hold, but it's, it's um, psilocybin as a use of a medical treatment is going to be FDA approved, I would say probably within the next year or two. Um, ketamine is another kind of therapy that's now available that you can utilize. Um, so like, I think that we have a, I mean, you have to think about it. Like mental health just became, you know, started developing in the 1950s. Like it's a fairly young craft here that we're working on. We have a long way to go. Um, but I'm pretty encouraged with some of the research that's coming out to allow us to kind of help and heal. Um, and I just want to leave you with this, cause I think this is important. Um, you know, the pandemic's been hard because we've all been disconnected, right? I think that's been the biggest challenge, you know, but when I talk to people that have a really strong sense of worth, right? Uh, and when I talk to people that seem very joyful and happy and very grounded, there's a couple common traits that we find, right? Many of them believe that they are deserving of love. They have a deep sense of belonging to not only their family, but the, the, the community around them. And this notion of connection is paramount to what they want. Um, but when I talk to those people about love, they can't talk to me about it without talking about heartache, right? And if they talk to me about belonging, they have some real stories about exclusion. And when they talk about connection, they talk about disconnection. And so I feel like a lot of us live in a world where we just want all the good stuff that life has to offer. You know, we live in Northern Virginia. I don't anymore. I'm in Duck right now. But, um, you know, the Northern Virginia area can be a really hard place. You know, it's high expectations, you know, lots of activities going to the best schools. I mean, it's just a lot, right? And I think that many of us, depending on what childhoods we had, we wanna give the best to our children and kind of save them from experience, heartache and exclusion and disconnection. But the reality is, is that you can't have one without the other. And you can't kind of decide which emotions you're gonna numb and which ones you're gonna allow in. And so I think what all of us need to do is we need to learn how to lean in to heartache and we need to learn how to lean into exclusion and disconnect and all these things so that we can allow ourselves the opportunity for the things on the left side, right? Like, you know, we can't get there without these things. And I think that sometimes when bad things happen to us, we shut down and it turns into trauma because we, it gets stuck. And so my recommendation is finding a voice for all these things so you can heal and learn and evolve and you know, grow into those things that you really want. So shame and vulnerability kind of go together. you know. And I think shame is one of the biggest things that I see in my office that I'm constantly trying to run counter to um, because vulnerability really, like we said, is a scary thing. But, but this is kind of in a real quick capsule what, what therapy is all about, how to build connection how to work through shame and how to make yourself available for vulnerability. So I promised to, I would talk about ways to cope. I think we can just kind of list these. I think these are just things we know. Turn the news off. <laughs> Don't watch it all day, every day, CNN. Like I think one of the things I hate most is the seven by 24 newsreels that has taken us away from our little boundaries and open them up worldwide that now I don't just have to worry what's happening in South Riding or Chantilly or even Virginia. I have to worry about what's happening in, in the world, you know, and everything that's happening and our brains just weren't meant for that kind of hit continually. 
And so I know with COVID people watch the news a lot. So I really recommend watching, you know, for 30 minutes, maybe once. And if you need to see it again, see if anything's changed at the end, that's it, but then turn it off. You know, be careful because I mean, our, all of our devices have it too. Take care of your body. You're doing it by being part of this awesome community with, um, uh, with Capital. You know, take your deep breaths, stretch, meditate, eat well, exercise, all these things. Watch your alcohol use. Listen, I know it's a joke, but it's not good for you. I don't care what people tell you about the red grapes and how they're kind of good for you. They're not. Like it affects your sleep, but affects all these things. Um, anything in moderation is certainly acceptable, but let's face it, like many people say, well, I think it's a glass, but I should, I think I have one here. I mean, they're wine glasses, like, you know, can fit an entire bottle on it. So let's be mindful about these ways that have become normalized in our society. And it's, 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 it's not helping us kind of evolve as it relates to our overall mental health. Um, and make sure you get your COVID-19 vaccine. So these other things are some ideas, but I want to make sure I have time for some, I said I'd do 45 minutes. So here we go. I wanted you just to meet a few of the people. These are all of my licensed therapists that we have at the Wellness Connection. Um, this includes some of our, I call them body work, cranial sacral. We've got acupuncturist, we have hypnotherapist, and of course we have art. We have, um, Suzanne here is someone who specifically focuses on ADHD because it's such a huge issue in our area. Um, and then on the bottom line here are some of our residents and our um, interns that allow us to offer sliding scale fees for people who need it. And then these are our favorite guys. These are, um, Bo is an actual trained therapy dog and Bailey is my new pup. He's my COVID puppy that we got. And uh, she is getting ready to embark on a two week training to become a certified therapy dog. So my husband and I are gonna cry like a baby when we have to send her. Um, but we really believe that dogs have this great way of healing. Um, we're also opening up a retreat. Um, part of this endeavor that I am embarking on is to open up a retreat down in um, Seneca, South Carolina, next to Greenville, with the intention of offering more intensive therapies. Because when there's a crisis, sometimes 50 minute increments of coming and seeing a therapist is just not enough. So we're going to invite couples and families and parent child kind of dyads to come in where they spend five days with us. And we really dig into what's going on with the dynamic and hopefully treat the whole family at the same time. And it's going to be on a beautiful lake on Lake Kiwi. And we're going to have boating and kayaks and stand up paddle boards and saunas and pools and fire pits for our fireside conversations. And uh, my husband is going to be the uh, chef on this endeavor. So we look forward to welcoming people in this really therapeutic kind of space where we can introduce you to lots of different modalities here. So you're not just stuck with one. And then I'm sure Raj and Jeremy will share with you guys our um, kind of this list of different places to go. I just want people to know that there's lots of resources out there. And so don't hold it in. Uh, it's not going to serve you. Your body's not going to let you just get over it. Um, reach out, talk to somebody just by sharing that weight with somebody can really, you know, make all the difference. So that's the end of that. I'm going to get rid of it. And then open us up to any questions that you guys may have. Yeah, so we have two questions right now. Before I get into those, I just want to remind everyone that you can ask a question in the Q&A chat and it's completely anonymous. So I can't even read it. It just says anonymous attendee. So send in the questions. But um, the first question was, how do you know what kind of talk therapy to do? Mm. Well, I always joke, I decided that I feel like finding the right therapist is like finding your right partner in life. <laughs> like I decided maybe I should create an app for therapists, swipe right, swipe left, because I feel like so many people just believe that you go to a therapist and that is the right person. You know, all therapists are the same. Well, they are not like, we know that, right? Teachers aren't the same. Therapists are not the same. I, I, there's been so many clients that have come into me and said, you know, I've done more in two weeks, Susan, with you than I did in two years with my last therapist. And my, my brain is like, well, why did you stay there for two years if you weren't getting something from it? So I think what's really important when you're finding a therapist is you've got to make sure that you feel connected to that therapist. You've got to make sure that you feel heard and you have to feel safe because you're not going to open up if you don't feel that. So talk therapist is I would, and I, we offer this, we say, call us, talk to your therapist before you come in so that you can make sure that you feel okay and connected to them before you waste the money and come in and be like, well, oh, it didn't work. 
Um, many of our therapists are going to help guide you through using these other modalities. So if you're curious about whether to do talk therapy or something else, um, when you come in and meet with us, usually in our assessment, we're kind of trying to pay attention. Is there sleep problems? Is there stomach problems? Do you have neck pain? You know, we're trying to take a look at it holistically so we can make referrals as necessary. And on my side, I just say, skip me next week, go see Annette. And then come, you know, we, we kind of figure out a way so that you're not overtaxed with too much therapy because there is such a thing as too much therapy, you know? Hope that answers your question. And the next question was uh, pretty similar, but it just said, how do you know what kind of talk therapist to look for? Well, I guess talk therapy. So let me just, exp there's a lot of different kind, right? People can get really confused by the difference between a psychiatrist, a psychologist, a social worker, a marriage and family therapist. Like there's all these different names out there. If you, if you've ever been looking, um, psychiatrist, their job typically is to manage your medication. So they're looking to see, is there an opportunity where medication may help you create more serotonin dopamine in your brain so that you're not feeling so low or too hyped up. Right. So, you know, there's medications to help for that. That's what a psychiatrist typically does. Um, and then you have clinical psychologists and their main function is to do to assess, to, to provide a proper assessment, to know what are we dealing with here? But they also do talk therapy too. Um, and then you have licensed professional counselors, um, licensed clinical social workers and mer licensed marriage and family therapists that do the talk therapist. I don't think it, there's a right, I think it's the person. <laughs> like, I mean, I would really, don't just schedule and blindly go in. My recommendation is call, talk to somebody if you're not feeling it on the call, don't, don't go, right? Like it's, it's, it's not gonna work. They, they say that, you know, most of the efficacy of therapy has 100% to do with that relationship between you and the therapist. Um, you know, and I would say that some people, they don't like going out of network, but I would highly recommend if you are connected and jiving with somebody, like that is the best investment you can give for yourself. You know, I have clients who do travel sports and they go on these elaborate vacations. If they just took one of those things and put it into proactively working on their overall mental health and well-being, man, could all these things start falling into place? I think it's the best investment. So it's it's making sure that you have a connection with the person. That's that's the best advice I can give on that one. So those are all the questions currently. I know we have a couple minutes, so if anyone wants to send in any last minute questions. Totally yeah, and, and I can't yeah. type in through the Q&A, uh, but I do have a question for Susan and I can sort of audible it out. It's okay. This is Raj. Um, <laughs> you know, I've spent a fair amount of time and I think like a lot of members at Capital, um, the one of the reasons why Cap, I keep going back and sort of wanting, can't stay away from Capital is it is a therapy in sorts for me. You know, the I have a we have a great community at all locations, um, and it, when I go there for an hour, hour and a half, two hours, I forget outside world uh, for those two hours. And when I get on those mats, I cannot think of anything else. I have to think about the problem that's right in front of me because people are choking me out or wanting to take my arm home. You know. Mm -hmm. um, when you think about the overall concept of physical fitness as a means to sort of, how do you view that as a, will it completely replace it, especially in the COVID times? Um, it's, a lot of us are struggling because we're not able to go to the gyms uh, like that in, what's the, what's your recommendation, suggestion, at least in the interim we're dealing with this immediate problem and now uh, both important and urgent. I'll pause. Yeah, it's been hard. It was hard for me, right? Like, but I mean, I think that like anything that when it happens, you got to learn how to pivot. Like it is what it is, right? We can't change this thing called a pandemic and we can't change the, the rules that are out there with how many people can be in the workout. So it's impacting it. But, you know, I think what you have to do is just figure out how to, how to maintain connections, right? Like, I feel like at the beginning of the pandemic, we were all really good at having those FaceTime connections and we were really good about going. And I think we're all just freaking tired of the pandemic. And we've, we've, let, we've let our connections kind of fall apart as a result. So I think if there's a way to stay connected, like what you guys are doing here today, this is a way that you're connecting people. You're, you're talking about topics. Um, do you guys have an online opportunity for people to work out? I mean, is there, 
Do you have there any are, kinds yeah, of different locations have sort of different online virtual classes? Um, yeah, it's not the same, but it's better than nothing, right? And so sometimes we operate in what I call extremes, right? We're either all in, and I'm like, I'm tossing those tires. I remember tossing those tires, man. There, yeah. I'm tossing the tires. I'm running. I'm doing all these, you know, you know, jump up, you know, kind of squats and. You know, the reality is, is that, you know, you can create that at home. There's some really simple ways to get creative and creating it at home. And if there's not enough classes through there, connect with your four or five buddies, you know, that you may have connected with in the gym and create something in your, in your garage or your basement or somewhere that you guys can connect in this. I mean, I mean, I, I don't know how Zoom did it. I don't know how they managed this pandemic in the way that they did. But there is a way to connect or in my in my world, like sometimes, you know, finding the people that you're safe with. I, I was a very big supporter of, you know, we connected with the, some family friends of ours that we decided we're going to we're going to act as a family. and We're not going outside of the circle and we're going to stay safe and we're going to we're going to do that. And so it allowed us to have a little bit of socialization so we didn't feel so isolated. Um, and I had my son pick up people. And as a family, we just all sat down and talked about if we're in this, we're in this together. We all have to commit to this, this approach to the pandemic. So, um, you know, and getting out and walking, you know, getting outside, it's hard with the weather you guys are having now. Um, but I think you've got to connect in, in the ways that are available to you. Um, and even I've, you know, I've been able to reach out and do some of these other workouts, you know, in different, you know, it's, it's opened up my, my opportunity to try different things that I normally may have not tried. So it allows me to get a little creative in, in my own workouts and what I'm doing. A comment and a sort of follow-up question there. It's, it might be a hard question. Not everybody is um, readily open to you know, you've got different personalities. You've got type A's, B's, and C's and D's, and they are very conservative, um, hard, so they're in the shell. They, it's hard for them to actually take initiative and make the phone call. And this has, this pandemic and lack of sort of the physical touch or sort of social connection has really hurt that sector of the population. Right, yeah. Uh, so we, it's harder for them than other sections. So totally agree. Yeah. What's the, what's well, the okay. lifeline that they have? Um, well, hopefully, um, well, it's hard, right? Like, you know, yeah. we can't force people to do something that they're not willing to do, right? You have to be your own advocate, you know? But what I've always said, just from my own personal beliefs, if I see someone that doesn't, that seems to be isolating, I reach out. You know, I might make a phone call or I might say, hey, let's do tea at two today and you grab a tea, I'll grab a tea and let's just connect. Or you might send them over a bouquet of flowers or something to leave on their steps or something where I think all of us need to be more humane in our own expression of not only taking care of ourselves, but taking care of our neighbor. You know, and I mean, that's, I mean, I can, I can give you a much longer list of, you know, positive things that, you know, that I'm trying to get from this, right? We went from this crazy busy state to really being able to come back with family and paying attention to things, you know? Um, but I think it's opened up our humanity to, to, that we're all in something together and we're all supportive. And I love watching, you know, these communities that have done things that are going door to door and, and helping. So um, I think we have to pay attention for these people and we have to reach out and we have to say, are you okay? You know, um, you know, that's the best that we can do, but getting people to do something that they're not comfortable with. I've never, if I could learn how to do that, <laughs> I would be a gazillionaire, but I, I haven't learned how to do that other than education. So what you're doing here, if you have some of those type C's or D's as, as you refer to them as, maybe they're watching today and maybe they're going to make a connection with one of those pictures that I put up or they'll go to my website or they'll, or they'll reach out. All those hotlines are a resource for them. So education and then our humanity as, as a community of reaching out, I think is the best thing we can do. Yeah, well, well put, thank you, Susan. Mm -hmm. Noel, do we have any questions? No more questions. Great. Wow, we did it on the exact hour. That's impressive. <laughs> uh, Jeremy, any lasting thoughts? I certainly appreciate everybody taking the time and investing uh, an hour of your personal time and uh, spending with us. I think if that is um, hopefully if, you've taken some value, even if one person takes some value out of it, um, I think we have served the purpose here. I have a question for Anna, and that is, would you like to plug Capital Cares? Unmute yourself, Anna. 
Um, sure. Thanks, Jeremy. So um, if you guys aren't aware, Capital Cares is a program we kind of started at our Alexandria location um, just to give back. So we've done a couple things um, just to kind of give back to the community. It kind of started as just a small idea. Um, I think we started with recycling um, just to kind of make sure that we're helping give back to our environment. Um, and then it kind of just evolved from there. We did a couple fundraisers. Um, and then it's just something when Don approached me with this whole um, wellness connection, I thought it was a really great idea. Um, so really it's kind of a thing that we're here for you guys. Um, we're always here to reach out. If you have any questions or any ideas or anything that you guys wanna do, feel free to email me at Capital Cares, um, the Capital Cares email, and we can certainly uh, talk about it and see if we can get something going. And just remember, if you cannot remember Capital Cares at CapitalMBA.com, you can always just email any email on the website. It will get to me and I will make sure it gets to the right person. So if you guys have concerns, questions, criticisms, or ideas, we are always welcome. Um, and Susan, thank you so much for being a part of our evening tonight. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yep. Thank yep, you. Rajiv, thank you so much for setting this up, yep. for being thoughtful and caring as you are. Um... Thank you. <laughs> um, thanks a lot, Susan. Thank you, Noel. Um, and thanks for everybody signing off. Take care. Right, bye, everyone. Yep. Bye.